All right, you guys. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bob Troy to you guys. Um, who's going to be speaking to you guys today about, um, from the more perspective of the uh, disaster management, county level response to when we see an, an oil spill happen, how that works. Excellent. Uh, I'm on. I'm on. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, um, so I met Bob uh, earlier this year at a, a sort of refugio reflection uh, back up in Santa Barbara County. And uh, he'll tell us the whole story, but he um, basically helmed the county of Santa Barbara's uh, response to that unfolding disaster. So they haven't heard specifically about Refugio yet. So, okay. so you can, you can feel free to go into as much detail as you want. Um, uh, now, we've mostly been talking about environmental perspectives and the public's perspectives. Talked a little bit about government, but we haven't heard about the response to some of these coastal and marine management challenges from the perspective of local government. So this will be a great opportunity for you guys as well. Maybe a little bit in Hawaii, but, but most of you guys didn't, didn't hear about that. Most of you guys didn't go on the trip. So, um, so he's going to tell us about that. So his background is he comes to emergency management from Chicago, right, from Chicago. Came out here to Santa Barbara. And uh, Santa Barbara has a really robust um, uh, emergency response system. But in particular, Santa Barbara, unlike we talked the other day about um, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, that created a huge... Um, um, uh, management infrastructure inside the county government at Santa Barbara that's unlike just about anywhere else in the country, world maybe, but at least country, um, in terms of dealing specifically with oil and oil spills. So they have a very robust um, um, institution there. Uh, so he is he's going to tell us what, what happened um, and how, how they utilize their resources. But um, he just told me, I'm very sad, he just told me he, he's actually getting scooped up by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, uh, in a few weeks. So he's going to be um, expanding his role to the federal side of things. But for now, we have him. And so let's welcome Bob Troy to uh, Coastal Management. Thank you. Thanks. For, just use the keyboard to punch yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, so good afternoon. I hope you've all had lunch, and I'm not keeping you between you and lunch. But uh, I'll, uh, I have too many slides. I'll motor through a few of them, and I'll try and linger where there's more interest. So if you have questions, Feel free just to go ahead and, and raise your hand and throw them out. We don't have to wait to the end, but we can also talk at the end. Um, like Sean said, um, my background is in emergency management, and that's important because I am not an oil spill expert. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in English from Ohio State University. I avoided science classes like the plague, right? So <laughs> that's my background. And in emergency management, we tend to be jacks of all trades and masters of none, right? And so particularly, um, I worked in public safety in Chicago, for the city of Chicago for 18 years for the police department and then their office of emergency management. Our focus there was really, you know, on uh, most of the time on special events, man-made threats, um, man-made issues, right? And then on the natural side, it would be flooding and severe weather, th severe thunderstorms and tornadoes and that sort of thing. Um, Oil spills really weren't on our radar, and um, as Sean mentioned, um, Santa Barbara is a bit unique in that the Office of Emergency Management here does have a primary and fundamental role in oil spill response, which is really unlike just about any other place in the country. So, um, what I can talk to you about is the government side of things, um, the government coordination, the political um, side of things, and um, my experience is here, um, going back to May 19th of the previous year, where I didn't know much at all about oil spill response prior to then. So. Um, We'll just go ahead and start punching through, but like I said, feel free to ask questions. And as Sean mentioned, I'm going to FEMA. I'm still, the good news is this is still gonna be part of my region. Um, region nine encompasses California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, and the Pacific territories, right? And so I'm gonna be the disaster recovery coordinator for uh, for that region. And so I think I'll be on the road way too much and living out of you know a suitcase. So you can talk to us next year about uh, what the perspective is for the feds, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so we, and we'll, we'll hit on a little later. Um, FEMA doesn't have much of a role in oil spill response. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. And there may be some changes coming along those lines as well. So uh, this day, this incident is still in response, technically is still ongoing, uh, in that we still have, at least on a monthly basis, there are also some weather triggers that get people out there more often, county personnel going out to what we call Section 5, the main impact site, on at least a monthly basis to do testing and observation, to see if there's oil that's, uh, that, that's oozing out of the cliff face there, uh, and to do testing as necessary uh, um, to see if it's um, 90, uh, pipeline 901 or Plains oil. So in that, in that respect, response is still ongoing. And I guarantee if you ask the general public, is there still an ongoing response to the oil spill? You know, most people would say no. Um, this is not a formal after action. These are just mainly my opinions. They're, I think they're relatively centered and measured. Um, as Sean mentioned, the 69 oil spill was, uh, was a significant event in, in national history and really led to the modern environmental movement. And so um, 
you know, one thing that we talked about during the response was if you had to choose probably the worst place and most challenging place in the entire country to have an oil <laughs> spill, it's probably Santa Barbara. I mean, really, I can't think of any place that would be more challenging for a variety of reasons. Part of it's social, part of it's cultural, part of it's historical, but also because of um, everything from the natural environment, natural seeps, um, also the, the, the focus on the coastline here, and then also um, uh, uh, Native American and tribal uh, influence in the area as well. I mean, it's, it happened smack dab in the middle of a really uh, sacred area filled with artifacts. I mean, so for that and many other reasons, this was, this was not like an oil spill response in Alaska or Texas where, um, you know, quite reasonably, um, you know, talking to the, the, the Plains uh, uh, leadership and people that work nationally for, as contractors in oil spill response, they said, you know, quite reasonably, and they weren't bragging or anything, they just said, you know, in many of the parts of the country, this would have been cleaned up and done in about three weeks. It would have been a three week response in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, that, that's not what happened here. So. <laughs> Um, we also had the torch spill, and the reason why that's important is because it led to Santa Barbara County having a role in oil spill response. It led to us having a memorandum of, un of understanding with the state to include um, the locals, and in this case, Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management is part of the unified command response to an oil spill. And we are the only county in the state of California that has that agreement, and um, I'm not aware of any other place in the country that really has that type of agreement either. So this is a, an energy map. You can find this on the county's website. So, I mean, there are a lot of people that live here, that live there their entire lives, or come through here or drive through all the time. They really don't recognize or realize, I'm sure you all do because of your class and your training, um, you know, what uh, you know, uh, an oil-rich environment um, Santa Barbara County is, right? They think of it as, as a pristine coastal community and they really don't realize that, you know, there's a reason why those platforms are there and there's a reason why um, that there's, you know, inland uh, drilling and that's because, you know, oil was quite literally oozing out of the hillsides here and it didn't take, and it, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this was uh, an oil-rich area. But, um, you know, the, the general public doesn't really have that perception and so, um, ongoing natural seep during our response was a significant challenge because the perception, whether it was real or not, um, was that every tar ball that washed ashore for months afterwards was most certainly, you know, planes not one oil. When in reality, um, at least to the, to, the, um, to the degree that we could find according to testing, it was usually not the case. But it didn't matter. We sent people out to clean it up because perception is reality at a certain point. Um, this is the spill site on the map uh, and its relationship to the, uh, to our, our oil industry here and this is pipeline 901 this is 903 so this is called uh, we refer to it as 901 oil it was uh, very uh, it was heated oil um, for uh, viscosity for use of transport and so when it entered the water it, it you know basically cooled down and then stuck to all of the um, the rock face the cliff face and the cobble on the shoreline uh, which made for you know added to the challenge of this type of an oil cleanup um, basic facts, the initial estimate was 21,000 gallons. That was later, um, sh or shortly thereafter, um, revised pretty significantly, you know, upwards. Um, the, uh, the immediate impact was out at Refugio and El Capitan State Parks. Um, one of the things is we couldn't even agree on the proper pronunciation of Refugio, <laughs> right? So um, there's Refugio, there is Refugio, as, as some people say, and uh, then some of the, many of the locals insist that it is pronounced Refugio with an F. And, um, but um, this primarily affected state parks um, property, um, in particular Refugio State Park, and the superintendent of the parks, you know, um, who was an honorary member of the Unified Command, just said, he said, you can call it Refugio, you can call it Refugio, <laughs> I forbid you from calling it Refugio. So we went with that and called it Refugio. All right, so um, the um, incident command post, however, was housed in the Santa Barbara County Emergency Operations Center, which is where I work, is the building that OEM manages, and, um, and we'll talk a little about those intended purposes and how it worked during this incident. Uh, here's just a brief snapshot of the timeline um, you know but long story short is um, the early days of this response were 20 hour days of response and you know we didn't have crews out there um, we couldn't have crews out there on the overnight but the management and the unified command leading the response or managing the response I mean literally we're working in the early days working 16 or 18 hours and for us managing the emergency operations center we would shut up every night about 1 a.m. and be back by 5 and um, uh, in the you know, seven days a week, I, you know, I can, on, you know, I, I'm not, not trying to brag, but just to provide scope, because uh, this is not something you should be proud of, but I mean, honestly, I didn't take a day off for 82 days. And um, it just, I mean, that's, I, I just say that to illustrate of how all consuming this oil spill response was, was for us within the county. Um, here's an over, uh, overhead view of where it happened. So we had this inland pipeline rupture and just kind of dumb luck and gravity meeting each other. Um, 
it, it just happened to be in a particular spot where it was able to go and enter a culvert and go underneath the 101 and then come out underneath the 101 and then slash down right through this cliff face here and then hit the water and a lot of it entered the water and was swept down the coast and a lot of it just stuck to the, the coastline right there. Um, so this would have been a much different event had it stayed inland for a lot of reasons. Number one is just perception and intention by the part of the public. Part of it is also by then who responds, right? So if it's, a, um, if it's an inland oil spill, then on the federal level, the EPA is in charge, right? And then if it's in the water, it's the Coast Guard. In this instance, it started on land and went into the water. So we had co-federal on scene coordinators. We had both the EPA and the Coast Guard involved with the response. And so, um, and then we'll talk about a little bit of that makeup, the Unified Command a little bit. So, but for that reason alone, it was a challenging and a bit of a different response. Here's a picture of uh, where it ruptured underneath and where it came up from underneath the ground. Um, we declared a local emergency and the governor declared a state of emergency. Uh, in, in all total, there's about 97.6 miles of impacted coastline. And I don't have a sunshine, I don't have a slide handy that shows where we found positive and negative um, um, uh, 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 fingerprint matches, but I, I'll be happy to send that on to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, in, in total, it's 97 miles of coastline, but it's really interesting to see where um, the positive hits were found and where they weren't found. So we had about a seven, eight mile section out near the spill site where we had a lot of positive 901 hits. And then we didn't have a single other positive hit until you hit Ventura County. So the entire coastline from basically out where the state parks were um, until Ventura County, there was no 901 oil that we ever tested and found to be positive with extremely that. Patchy, yeah. Extremely patchy, extremely patchy. Not to say there wasn't, but none of the samples, and we'll talk a little about the sampling team. So the city of Santa Barbara out by UCSB and through CARP and, and, and uh, Summerlin through that entire area, we did not find any positive hits, but we sent out an awful lot of crews to go out there and um, sample and clean up oil there as, as tar balls came ashore there as well. Um, <coughs> state parks were both impacted and closed. Um, so there, you know, big impact in that respect. This was you know May, um, leading right up into uh, UCSB graduation and Memorial Day weekend. Um, a lot of cancellations there. Um, certainly, the number for deceased animals is much higher than this. But this is in terms of the, the animals that were found and located, and definitely tied to. Um, although we did, they did not necessarily test if it was 901 oil versus natural sheep or otherwise. Frankly, it really didn't matter. But um, 195 large birds, pelicans, didn't include small birds, so certainly a much higher number, 106 deceased mammals. Um, so, uh, and then up to 1,300 uh, field personnel in the operations section out there on the beach cleaning, uh, cleaning the beaches, and about 325 people working in our incident command post. Uh, this number, the financial figure is old, so I, this is, I mean, hasn't gone up by a whole lot, but um, this number is probably six months old with 131 million. It's gone up a bit since then, but it's, it's pretty minimal in terms of cost at this point. But, I mean, a, a significant amount of money um, to pay for the response, just the direct response costs themselves. I mean, so there are a lot of other peripheral costs that aren't associated. For example, um, uh, we hired a contractor to help us write our after action report. I just got their bill for that, which I'll be sending to the oil company um, to have them pay it, um, and that's not included in there. This is just mm -hmm. the direct response cost mm -hmm. that we're, um, reimbursed. Uh, here's a map. This is an example. Every day we would get new overflight maps showing where their sheen spotted out there in the channel. Um, they changed from day to day, uh, and they didn't necessarily, um, th that's not to say that it was all 901 oil, but that's, that was part of the challenge. There were seeps out there every day. Here's an example of one of our, what we call our SCAT maps. SCAT stands for Shoreline Cleanup Assessment Technique Teams, and they're primarily led by state, but also with uh, federal uh, uh, counterparts as well and then we integrated some locals into those teams as well um, number one included county folks that had the, um, the uh, requisite expertise to be part of those teams to go out and help recognize what was appropriate to sample what wasn't but also um, and we did probably none of this soon enough and we do it sooner in the future but then we also included some of our NGO partners like Channel Keeper and some of the other NGO partners that were really interested obviously in this response um, just for transparency just for partnership uh, and also for their feedback. I mean, these are people that live in that channel and playing in that channel and work in that channel every single day, as opposed to some of our personnel. Coast, we had Coast Guard on, on you know, on May, the spill happened on May 19th, and by May 20th at five in the morning, we had Coast Guard personnel coming in from all along the East and West Coast, right? But a lot of those people had never been to this part of California before. So we needed that local expertise and that local feedback. So, but the, um, these are the, the uh, oiling maps, they tell you according to, um, to legend here how heavy the, uh, the amount of oil was. So you see, I mean, the, the spill happened up here. Um, we still had oiling identified in Isla Vista, and uh, oiling down through here, and ultimately none of this proved to be tested in 901 oil. Like I said, that's not to say there wasn't any, but none of the tests that we found intended to be. But this is all part of uh, natural seep that, that is just part of the area here. And one of the obvious following questions was, 
when this rupture happened, they shut down all of the pipeline activity around here. So all the platforms were shut in. They ceased production. So did that, um, did this, them ceasing production lead to an increase in natural seep is a natural question, right? Kind of a natural release valve to pull all this oil out of the channel there uh, and pipe it inland and, and send it off to be processed. And if you shut that down, is there a natural increase in the pressure that then leads to increased natural seep? And I don't think we have an answer on that. So, you know, we've talked to a lot of people and asked their opinions and their best guesses, um, uh, uh, people from UCSB and other places. And, you know, you get a smattering of answers, but I think probably the safest answer is yes, it likely would lead to an increase of pressure. But the question is, how long would it take for that pressure to increase to be noticeable? And so that's the part I don't think we really know. There are some uh, um, some uh, uh, studies that will be happening, uh, going on in regards to the study of natural seep within the channel. And so we're very supportive in, in, of that. Ultimately, we just want transparency and accuracy. Um, this is um, this was an early uh, graphic that came out, and I think it was in the LA Times. Um, so their initial estimate was wrong in terms of 21,000 gallons. It was about five times bigger than that. But it's still a pretty good graphic in terms of uh, comparing um, the Refugio spill to the 69 spill in terms of the amount of oil impacted. So, I mean, uh, a drop in the bucket, comparatively, right? Uh, but not in terms of public perception, not in terms, not in terms of, of workload, and not in terms of, of you know, really the anger that, that uh, there was on the part of the public for this. I mean, and, and as there should be. Um, some photos, I'm sure you probably, if you were here, and unless you have been here since then, you probably recall photos at the time, but here, there are a few in here. You can see um, this was the, the afternoon of the spill. Um, you can see where the oil was in the water, that, which made it offshore. Some of the early vessels that were there, we have agreements with private vessels to go out that have boom that go out immediately to try and scoop up oil and catch it with boom and then scoop it up, skim it off the water and take it out. The challenge was that because the water, the oil entered the water right along the shoreline and kind of swept down the shoreline, you couldn't have these boats because of the wave and tidal activity come in too close to shore for safety reasons, right? So you can't really have these boats come right along the shore and scoop it up very easily. They could come out and take the oil that was a little further away, but it was difficult to catch that. That was just kind of skirting down the coastline there. Another overhead view of uh, the oil there at the, at the state park. And, you know, of course, we need a few emotional impact ones. And I intentionally put these in because um, it's too easy, of course, to, to, to look at this, you know, logically and in terms of numbers. And this matters as well. Even if you don't care about this, it matters in terms of public perception, right? And so a few other photos that people want to go out and help during an oil spill response. But the problem is there's, there, there are very few ways that are safe for the oil or for for the um, citizens to come out and volunteer to help that are actually effective. And that's a real challenge that we found some solutions to. There are no perfect solutions to. And I guarantee will be a problem and a challenge in the future for any other significant oil spills. Um, you know, this this is what was in the paper. This was in the media. This was on May 19th. You know, people going down and picking up pelicans out of the whale and carrying themselves. Now, what do they do with that pelican? How do they clean it? Were they trained to clean that pelican? How do they decontaminate their clothing and everything else that came from it? The, I mean, there, there are 100 you know, challenging questions that come with this and significant issues, but um, this is the reality of what you're going to deal with with any oil spill on the coastline. And then, of course, we had, I had to show you one where it's cleaned up <laughs> so we can all feel a little better, right? Okay, so um, this is, I, I mentioned before that Santa Barbara County has uh, an MOU with the state of California. This is our oil spill contingency plan, um, which are in the process of updating. We'll talk about that. Um, so one of the issues, though, that was really challenging for us and for perception from the public and our elected officials um, is because, to be frank, people don't really care or study um, about oil spill response in advance of a spill. But after a spill, um, then, of course, there's great attention focused on it. So um, one of the problems or challenges for us as part of the Unified Command was that the oil company was part of the Unified Command. And so the public perception was, well, you've let the, you know, the, the foxes in the hen house, the arsonist is, you know, for a fire is part of the, the command or the response. And you know, what are you doing? They should, be, they should be locked up and in jail. And the only, you know, the only way to satisfy the, the, the public perception is if you know, we would have publicly you know, bull whipped the, the, the responsible party, uh, incident commander, as we call it. But we didn't make that up. This is federal law. This is code of federal regulation that says during an oil spill, um, the unified, where practicable, the framework for the response, man, response management structure is a system that brings together the functions of the federal government, the state government, and the responsible party, the oil company, to achieve an effective and efficient response where the OSC uh, maintains authority. So that's the federal hunting coordinator range authority. So what that means is, um, ultimately, the federal hunting coordinator has the final say. They have 51% of the vote, and that's either the EPA or the Coast Guard, or in this instance, both um, that have that. 
and that uh, the state in this in California, that's the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and, and then also working with OSPR, which is part of uh, Fish and Wildlife, and then the responsible party. But because we had an agreement with the state, then we were included to be part of that. So this is our MOU that says that Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management will represent our operational area. An operational area is a California term in emergency management, and basically it means the county level of government, inclusive of all of its jurisdictions. So you'll hear about either OEMs, offices of emergency management, or in California, it's also frequently called emergency services. So in Ventura County, um, it's OES, and it's, part, it's under the Sheriff's Department. Um, you have a great OES here. Um, the director is a guy named Kevin McGowan, and super sharp, super together, super bolted down, um, and a really good uh, team he has there. And so they've been dealing with the Grove incident, which I don't know you may or may not be talking about at a later day. And so he could echo um, uh, he could echo a lot of the things that I'm saying. You probably have, uh, I'm sure, slightly different experience, but I think 90% of what I'm saying he would agree with. And so he and Ventura County OES were also part of uh, our response. We brought them in as agency reps. Um, they didn't have any direct legal um, with the, uh, jurisdiction or authority in this response, but we're good partners with them. And so we made sure that they had a seat at the table as well to provide informal input into the response. Um, this is a copy of the, or a picture of the org charts uh, that shows that, so here in our plan shows that we have the local and scene coordinator as well as part of what we call this ICS structure, this incident command structure. And this was you know, a picture of one of the actual um, incident action plans for this response that shows who the actual people were. So on the Coast Guard side, it'll be the captain of the port down in LA Long Beach. So we're considered part of that, that area. And so there are federal plans. It's called the area. The, there's the area contingency plan, and that's managed by the Coast Guard and the state. And then we have our oil spill contingency plan for Santa Barbara County, which is state work, or us working with the state. And uh, so we can see where the EPA and the states and that was me and the director at the time, and then the oil company uh, incident commander. Um, initial response, county fire was uh, received uh, calls 911 um, alerting to the odor that was out there on the coastline. Um, just kind of dumb luck, good luck. Um, county fire and OEM were out taking place in an exercise at an oil facility out along that coastline, so they were only a couple miles away and uh, responded pretty quickly and then located. It took them a while to locate the source of the oil. I mean, they could just see oil was going in, into the ocean, but it took a while to figure out, trace it back and figure out where the burst pipeline was and then to figure out who was responsible for it. Um, but they responded, took part in that. They did some, some damming and berming to try and prevent it, but frankly, really couldn't stop it. Public health uh, assessed uh, the public health threat uh, on those, that first day um, because the uh, county public health director has legal authority over what uh, safety for the citizens of Santa Barbara County. Um, they, working with state parks, decided to go ahead and evacuate uh, um, review of state park. The odor was, was pretty strong out there that day and just err on the side of caution. And then also, ultimately, we evacuated Capitan as well. Uh, and for another reason, we knew we were going to have to bring in a ton of equipment and personnel and to have them work out of those locations. Um, local personnel, as I mentioned, did go out and accompany those SCAT assessment teams. Um, but the majority of the response assets, and this is, this is where oil spill response is really different than other types of disaster response. We'll talk a little more about that is that the, the bulk of the response assets for this oil, an oil spill response are not local. And that's different from other types of disasters, right? So fires and floods and mass shootings, whatever it is, most of the people that respond to those are gonna be your local public safety, your local first responders, so whether it's police or sheriff or fire departments, right? Oil spill response is radically different. And so um, most of the assets were either state or federal um, or contracted by the responsible party, right? So these oil companies, um, they can't maintain an army of personnel to come and manage it. So there are contractors that specialize this and they have contracts with those personnel. So like one of the big companies was Wood O'Brien, but there were a lot of contractors, or contracts already in place. So they just you know picked up the phone and dialed and, and activated the contracts and brought personnel in to come. And that was everything from people out on the beach cleaning uh, the beaches to helping with the management and control, going back to that org chart that I kind of showed you earlier. So this is something that's really different and hard for um, locals to kind of grasp and, and accept, right? So whether it's elected officials or the citizens, they're used to seeing local first responders out there. You're, local, you're used to seeing your local fire department if they're responding to disaster, and that just doesn't happen. One of the reasons why is federal law. So it's an OSHA, OSHA requirement. You have to have what's called HAZWOPER training uh, before you can deal with oil spill response. So even not all fire personnel even have HAZWOPER training. Um, there's a lot of your field crews that go out for wildland fires and that are seasonal firefighters, part-time fire, firefighters don't have HAZWOPER training. So when, that picture earlier with the guy carrying the pelican and people out there, that's all against the law, right? <laughs> so even though I might want the oil cleaned up, I can't say, yeah, citizens go out there. And, you know, so we had the bucket brigade on the first day, the first couple days where Home Depot and other places said, we'll give you five gallon buckets, anybody that wants to come and pick up oil. 
problem is it's illegal. People aren't trained to do it. So the government certainly can't authorize it, and that's federal law. Um, anyway, so those really difficult for, for uh, local leadership and the elected officials and the citizens to understand why you don't have local public safety out there doing the, the response. And we'll also talk about, um, I mentioned earlier, that the incident command post, which directs field operations, was in the county's emergency operations center. That would be the subject for a whole different other presentation, but it's, it's kind of cross purposes, I'll put it that way. Field response in the ICP is directing tactical resources, so shovels and personnel and equipment out there on the ground, right? Um, or police and firefighters, whatever they are. And an emergency operations center coordinates at a 10,000 foot level, coordinates information and then resources in support of that. But the problem is in the county EOC, there wasn't a whole lot for us to do because we weren't using local or we weren't using state or even really government resources. I mean, you didn't, you didn't have Coast Guard or, or Fish and Wildlife personnel out there cleaning up oil either. These were all private contractors that were brought in. So it was kind of, it's an odd situation. And the, the issue with it is that it runs contrary to how we train in public safety and emergency management every other day of the year. So we train according to this, this system called the Incident Command System. It's part of the National Incident Management System. It's a, Theoretically, you can have emergency managers or police and fire, depending on their rank and their level, all have to take the same type of ICS training. So using common terminology and common structures. So that org chart that I showed you earlier is 100% consistent with what an org chart and the same, same titles that they should be using on the East Coast, the Midwest, anywhere in this country. If you accept federal, federal dollars, grant dollars to help support public safety, you're obligated or required to use the system, right? So the good news was those Coast Guard strike teams that came in on early on May 20th walked into our EOC, they saw the different sections, the logistics section, the operations section, the planning section, finance admin, um, joint information center, and they all knew right where to go and what color vest to put on and, and broadly speaking knew what their respective roles would be. That's the good news, right? But um, the problem is with an oil spill, we, we train, we always, we, in, in emergency management, we have a phrase. We say all, all incidents or all disasters start and end local. And what that means is the first responders are always going to be your local police and fire or public works if it's a flood or whatever it might be, right? And as it exceeds their capabilities, they'll call on assistance. There are mutual aid agreements or we can do it through emergency management. So you can bring in state. Um, you know, the cities will then request assistance from counties, counties then request assistance from the states, and if they exceed state capabilities, then we get federal assistance, right? It's generally the way it goes. And, um, but we, we say it starts locally because the locals have to request assistance from the county and up that chain, and then back down. As you start, as the event starts to come under control, you start to release those resources and it comes back down to the local level. And then ultimately the recovery from any disaster has to be on the local level, ultimately. It may have federal assistance, federal dollars, but it's the locals that are doing it ultimately. But that's radically different from um, an oil spill response. There's also a couple other exceptions. One of them is terrorism, right? So you always, there's always that, you know, kind of cliche stereotype in movies where, you know, the FBI storms in and says we're taking over because it's terrorism. Well, it's technically true in the realm of terrorism that there's an automatic, um, the, the FBI has automatic jurisdiction, right? And so that's kind of true for terrorism. There's some public health issues where public health has some authorities that come in on the federal level. Uh, but by and large, um, it's always, it always starts local and it's only when the locals request help that then the county or the state or the federal um, assistance can come in. One of the big exceptions is an oil spill. And what we have here is a mandated kind of top down or federal down um, uh, response. Earlier I showed you the Code of Federal Regulation that, that by law says that the, the response will be led by either the Coast Guard or the EPA working with the state. So that's federal law and that runs contrary to how we train. So police and fire and emergency management personnel throughout the entire country train and using the same system starting from the ground up and then bringing in then adding on county resources, adding on state resources, adding on federal resources as necessary. But the core of it's always local. And with the federal response during an oil spill, it's exactly the opposite. It starts off as a federal, a federally led response. And as you can see earlier, if, I mean, if we didn't have in Santa Barbara County, if we didn't have that MOU, we wouldn't have had a seat at that table to manage the response. They would have been off working in another building. We would have had no legal authority or right to be in there or part of that building or privy to it. We would have been just kind of um, beholden to whatever information or, or, or goodwill that they offered to us. But because of that, we have a legal authority to be part of that response. And that's different. And the, the 150 unknown, what is? What's the oh, unknown? so these were people. This is me doing quick math off of the signage okay. sheets we had at our okay. AOC. Okay. Um, so bad handwriting. Okay. People okay. I couldn't That's figure out. So okay. like literally, we went through and just figured out we had in our county AOC for 13 days. Uh, people working out of there. 62 different government agencies and 54 different uh, private contract agencies that worked there in that this time. Is, this is early on in the. In the first 13 days, yeah. Okay. First 13. Um, this is some uh, some photographs of the county's emergency operations center. 
So it really doesn't give a full sense of it, but I mean, we had parking you know, way down the road and up the hill behind it, and we had uh, way up in the top of the hill behind there set up parking lots and then have buses to shuttle people down from the parking areas it's on Galita, there. Or it's uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's an unincorporated area, but yeah, on the border of Santa Barbara and Galita. So this is the county's emergency operations center, and you know we looked, so we had every square inch had trailers or tents in it, and we literally had people meeting in closets. That's I mean that's how cramped we were in there, and how much space there was. But you can see this is that that system I told you about earlier, where you can see up there it says management, and over here is logistics, and over there's operations, and that's planning. And so you see these people wearing the different colored vests, and these are people, you know, probably I would guess I'm just throwing something on the wall. I'd say that probably. 25% of these people live in the greater area around here, so meaning Santa Barbara, Ventura, and a lot of people came from LA and Long Beach. But you know, a, a good chunk of these people, the majority of these people came from other parts of the country. So that's where that advantage of having a built-in system works because you're not, you may have to introduce each other by name, but you know, hopefully you, you at least have all studied the same management system. Okay, so challenges. Um, um, so, uh, like I served as, and other people with uh, the, other, the director and some other people in our shop served as the local on scene coordinator. And we represent not just Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management, not just the Santa Barbara County level of government. We're part of the, the county CEO's office, the county executive officer, officer's office. Um, so, it's not just county level of government we represent. We also, through that MOU and by the statewide emergency, standardized emergency, ma emergency management system, represent the jurisdictions as well. Earlier I mentioned the op area and it's like this kind of holistic view of, of, um, of disaster response where it's the county and the jurisdictions and the unincorporated areas are kind of work taken as a whole and working together. And so, um, these other, like the, the, the federal on scene coordinator, um, you know, the Coast Guard one represented the Coast Guard, the United States Coast Guard, one agency, huge agency, but one agency. And same with the EPA and same with the state as well. And but however, on the local side, we had to represent not just our office's interests or the, the county level of government, but also all the jurisdictions as well. So we had to represent the city of Goleta and the city of Santa Barbara, et cetera, and their interests. So we, we had a much more varied set of interests to try and represent. And so that, you know, sometimes we had to slow down the conversation and say, and, make, and to make sure that whatever planning initiative or planning documents or planning product was being produced, that we had to then take it back to our subject matter experts. Earlier I mentioned that in emergency management, we're kind of jacks of all trades and masters of none. So that was really true. You had one person sitting in a seat, we might produce a planning document that then I would need to take back to, um, to get legal review from county council for Santa Barbara County or I might need to take back to the Office of Planning and Development because they had regulatory oversight for permit, the permit conditions to resume, you know, uh, either, um, either clean up of this, uh, certain sites or resumption of, uh, of, uh, resumption of the pipeline authorities would fall under their environmental health or planning and development. So we had a whole host of people we'd have to go and coordinate with. So it was a little, a little more challenging in that sense. Um, the Unified Command is focused on response. Laser focused on response, as you would want them to be, right? You want them to just make their sole job is to get up there and how quickly can they clean up this oil? And um, we we had other interests that we were you know forced to deal with or, or obligated to deal with, but besides just response, so a lot of say for example public engagement. So that was one of the things we would have to lobby and advocate for was. Uh, because we're locals and we hear from our local citizens what matters to them, and we'd hear the questions they had, we knew that there was a need for information. So we would work and we'd set up a town hall kind of meeting where people could come and learn more information from the different agencies about what was going on within the response. But those are the types of um, activities we would have to advocate for and ensure that the Unified Command um, would would uh, you know assess and and, and and take part in accordingly. So you know we have a much broader range of, of focus than, than just the Unified Command. And then, the, as you were earlier, I mentioned that um, the responsible party, the oil company, being part of the Unified Command. I mean, just we still hear about it, right? I mean, there you know, some of our local, our, our, our you know, our local elected officials. Just, I mean, it it, it is such a divisive history, uh, issue. Oil spill response. There are no heroes in an oil spill response, right? When there is a flood or a fire, you know, your fire department's out there, and everybody loves their firefighters, right? And so there gets to be a good guy in a, in a fire response in a wildland. So our Sherpa fire and Ray fires this summer. There gets to be a good guy. In an oil spill, there are no good guys, right? There are no, <laughs> nobody, nobody gets the pat on the back. And so um, that's something that was a real struggle to deal with. And, and the answer to that is education, right? It's not because, trust me, the uh, oil company uh, uh, representative did not have um, significant say. They got to voice their concerns, um, but ultimately the Coast Guard, the, the federal engine coordinator, had final say for everything. And so really the true goal and intent of including them is, quite frankly, to make for an efficient uh, response 
uh, and, and quite frankly, that they pay for as much as possible. Right? So when there's not an identified responsible party, there's a national pollution fund that can be tapped to pay for response. But you know, there's a finite amount of money in there. And um, if there's no responsible party identified, then, then taxpayers are on the hook for that. But when you know who the responsible party is, we want them to pay for it. We don't want taxpayers to pay for it. And the whole goal to have include them in is every resource we ordered up, we would hand them, you know, hand them the bill to it directly, and they would pay for it directly, and it would all be tracked and accounted for, or whatever. But because otherwise, otherwise, what would happen have to happen is the government would pay for it, you all would have to pay for it, and then we would have to try and get reimbursed for it. So, to the degree that we can have them pay for it directly, that's it's better for everybody. I may be mistaken, but I thought the oil source funds fund was through the oil company taxes, not. Good question. You're, you're right, but it's you're right, but it's still there are a lot of governmental um, uh, costs that don't get reimbursed out of that. When there is, I mean, let's put it this way: um, when 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 they're using that fund, not all of the the agency response uh, costs are going to be reimbursed from that. Um, in the same way that so cer certainly um, all the time that every county employee spent on this response was tracked. We set up a, a, a cost code for that on day one, and the bill, 100% of that went to the responsible party and they paid for it. And, and I, in, in, in fairness to them, I want to you know, make clear, they did not balk about cost ever during the response, ever. I mean, we whatever we asked for, um, the question would be, where can we get it from? But it was never how much is it going to cost. I mean, or there was never any pushback on that. So I, I will give them full credit for that, that they, they, um, they I mean, on day one, uh, the responsible party incident commander said, uh, the rest of us in UC said, he said, look, um, I know that I can pay for this now or I can pay for this later, but either one way or the other, I'm going to pay for this. I'd rather <laughs> pay for it now. And so that was the tone and the tenor within the UC for them, so to, to their credit. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you're right. A lot of it is paid for by, by taxes into the fund, but it's not a total recoup of, 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 of costs. And the taxpayers will be on the hook to a certain degree no matter what. Um, and then natural seeps, like uh, we mentioned, it just the ongoing, on a daily basis, it seemed, um, we were scrambling people and sending them back out to the beaches because there'd be a new sheen or new tar balls coming ashore. Um, you know, it's hard to say for sure, but you know, I, people that were relatively knowledgeable and that I found reasonably trustworthy within the response estimated that, you know, pretty much all the oil was scooped up out of the water within about four days. But for months, we had people going out there and, and skimming uh, oil off the water, just if there was a sheen or, or tar balls. And it's just, it's just kind of, it was the right thing to do under the circumstances. But the probable reality is, the reality, and we didn't, obviously didn't test it all, but the reality of the situation is that most of it was scooped up out on the water that was recoverable. The recoverable oil was scooped up pretty quickly. Um, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have people out there for months um, dealing with that. Here's a, a oil slick map from satellite just to show some of, uh, and those were, there again, those were daily, different maps producing it. And you can see a lot of those um, go back to, um, um, there were slicks of maps, but they don't correspond, like I said earlier, with um, where we actually found uh, no one um, um, positive match oil. Okay, um, what else is more about local response, logistical support? One of the real challenges was um, information, right? So communication is always, always, always a problem. It is always imperfect. So it doesn't matter when we have a big disaster or a big response, afterwards we conduct an after action review and we produce an after action report. We did for this as well. And I can guarantee you, it doesn't matter what type of disaster you're looking at, you can go anywhere in the country and it doesn't matter if it's a fire, flood or terrorism, if you look and read the after action report, communication is always gonna be one of the cited areas for, as an area for improvement. Just communication is imperfect, it's, it's never perfect, right? And so that was certainly the case with our response. And in one respect, you know, Perception is reality, right? It doesn't matter how well, how good of a job you're actually doing about cleaning up oil. If you're not conveying that well and effectively, and if you don't have transparency, um, then then you lose in the court of public opinion. And um, we didn't do as good a job as we should have or could have done in term in, in, in that respect during this response. Uh, I have no problems, no problems uh, saying that whatsoever. And I can predict, I break out my my crystal ball. And if there's an oil spill tomorrow, we'll be better at it, but that part still won't be perfect. And it, it doesn't matter, right? It fire, flood, any disaster anywhere in this country, that part will always be an area for improvement. Um, but why is it? Why is it? Well, so in this instance, um, yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, because communication is, is difficult. But, and, you know, there are a lot of. I'm thinking of some of the emails that I got from um, Incident Command about a, you know, press release or something like that. And you click on it, you get 404, document does not exist. I mean, at a much more fundamental level, there was some dysfunction. There, oh, yeah, there's some real low-hanging fruit that, that, yeah. that uh, has been or can be or will be solved. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But like one, one real clear um, concrete example also is that, so 
Um, within the county's emergency operations center that I showed you pictures of earlier, there's something called the Joint Information Center. And, it, it, you know, and this is just a, a physical building, a physical room, right? What matters is the process underneath it, right? And so what I mentioned earlier that there is a very universal process called ICS for um, emergency re or disaster response. I, I feel strongly about that. That's true. Um, where we don't have a clear internet process or anywhere near is within joint information centers or joint information systems, as they're called. And so consequently, right now, if you go and look in the state of California, um, so for our uh, Santa Barbara County Emergency Public Information Plan or San Diego's or San Francisco's um, and, and certainly state and federal ones, every single one of us would use a different set of um, job titles, job aids, and different process. Largely speaking, it's the same. Um, but I was amazed by how people, how much people got um, wrapped around the axle of you know different terminology for job titles, and so that's one or that's one area where during this initial response in this first 15 days, um, that caused confusion. It led to confusion. Um, county personnel, we weren't as trained up as, as we should have, and we literally just had a public information exercise um, uh, four weeks earlier, and um, so I, I felt you know in one sense we were pretty well prepared, but on the other hand, we just still weren't doing everything as well as we should have. I, I don't think the Coast Guard would disagree with me. You know, I think it's pretty candid to say um, they would frequently have um, the lead PIOB, a Coast Guard rep, and then went back and forth with Coast Guard and State. We had people that had a lot of training, uh, but maybe they didn't have a whole lot of real world experience. And then part of the problem too is then they would rotate it out after four days and you get somebody new in. And so on the local level, we tended to have more often the same personnel. Because why? Because we, we live here and that's all we did for, for months. Um, but uh, state and federal partners would rotate through a lot. And so particularly when it comes to public information and building trust and building establishing those relationships, that took time. Mm -hmm. So we'd get to the point where we were all just clicking together and moving nicely and then there'd be some staff rotations. Mm -hmm. and, and as external um, yep. things happened, they would throw more wrenches in it. And it was, it was a bumpy road. That was, I, I think yep. it was the bumpiest area of the response. And um, so yeah, there's definitely that. And then there are technical issues like, you know, um, some technical tools um, that, that certainly can help. And you know, public, in, public information changes rapidly too. Obviously, in, with the advent of social media, um, it's, it's, not the, it's not the old days. And so frankly, there are some people that are still invested in 10 years ago where you know, a single daily press release suffices, right? Or maybe you know, or they want to have, you know, they want to stop having press conferences. And, you know, most people really agree that you need, to, you need to lean forward when it comes to information. And you have a daily press conference until, you know, even after the press stops showing up, you still keep doing it. And you need to push social media around the clock. And we didn't do um, everything we should have for that. Um, cost accounting. So I mentioned earlier traditional disaster response. Um, you know, th there's, there's a real oiled process in place. And there is. And part of that is the cost end of it, right? So um, I know if we have a disaster here, if it's a fire or flood, let's say it's a flood, and it exceeds our, there are certain objective thresholds for certain types of grants and then certain subjective thresholds for different types of disaster declarations. But if we declare locally and then the state declares and then if it goes to FEMA and then the president declares and there's a, a presidential disaster declaration, right? Um, then that opens the floodgates of money. I mean, ultimately what FEMA does more than anything else is, is bring a checkbook, right? And so um, there's a very established process for that in place. And, um, and when you track those costs, there are a lot of guidelines already in training, already in place, they're incremental costs, right? So um, overtime counts towards that, normal costs don't. So they look at it, the feds look at it and say, well, wait a second, you would have paid those fire police personnel 40 hours a week anyway, so we're, you know, we're not gonna reimburse you for that. But because they worked 30 hours extra, we'll, count, we'll, we'll take that and apply that towards the cost and you'll get a 75% reimbursement on those costs. And same with supplies or anything else, it's really incremental, things you, costs you wouldn't have incurred otherwise. Um, but during an oil spill, it's different, right? Because we want 100% of our cost back from the oil company. So it's not just tracking overtime, it's tracking all the straight time. And so we don't practice that system as much as we would otherwise. Um, right, one key example is um, the use of the county's emergency operations center. Should we charge the uh, oil company for using that for 13 days? On one hand, you say, no, nah, it's our mission. It's, you know, we're good partners and that's what we do. And then we're happy to, to be of service. On the other hand, you say, no. Oil company causes this. This is not a, an act of nature. This is an act of man, and therefore they should pay for every penny. But then the question is, what do you charge for that? Well, we didn't have a good process in place for that, um, you know. And so I, I was kind of advocating, say, okay, we'll go to find five hotels around here with major conference rooms and ask them, you want, you know, say you want conference or ballroom space to house 325 people, and you want 24-hour access, and you want turnkey 
um, IT and software support, higher, you know, hardwired uh, computers and phones, everything ready to go. And what did that cost you for 13 days? I mean, anybody that's ever, um, you know, planned a wedding knows how expensive that can be, right? <laughs> and so that would have been a pretty significant cost. But then anyway, we had to go back to some federal cost accounting standards, and we ultimately came up with uh, a number that we submitted and got reimbursed for. Um, you can argue that it was too much or too little. Probably. No hose bar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, those those are the, like, the, the the small details, just like you said, getting a four of or uh, that 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 you get hung up on it, waste a lot of time on it, and, and lose a lot of credibility with, quite frankly. Um, anyway, so lessons learned, right? So I know you all talked about Deepwater Horizon, right? And so, um, you know, somewhere, I don't know, a few weeks into this response, um, uh, the, the, the director, I was, I'm the deputy director, uh, the director then and I, we, you know, we spent a lot of time talking. We started doing more research and, and looking at other after actions and, you know, kind of finding, well, wait a second, the headaches that we're having right now have been, have been felt before. These aren't new headaches. This is this is this is this is a, there's a process here that that repeats itself. And so, if you go and look at uh, Deepwater Horizon and look at their after action reports, there are a lot of strikingly similar issues. Um, since uh, our spill, then there was the Grove incident here in Ventura County, which was in a barranca and purely on land. So a lot of differences because it was in the water, but there were a lot of similarities. Yep. And one of the key ones was the difficulty or challenge and the need for successfully and effectively integrating local expertise into the response. So the same deal, same, the exact same issue that we had up in Rio was, was felt down here for that incident. And the other issue was then information and communication, right? And so there was a resistance early on, there was a request for, you know, to have a, a town hall meeting to, to, to fill the public in directly on it. And uh, you know, I think the long story was that response didn't feel like, and, and Ventura OES was not part of the response because they didn't have an MOU, but you know, they felt they weren't ready to do a town hall yet. They didn't have enough information, the good answers ready, and they were focused on, on cleaning it up. Uh, but there was huge backlash over that, right? Because that matters. And so these are the lessons that if we don't learn, we're gonna continue to face, and I guarantee if there's no well tomorrow, we'll look at, we'll face. So some quotes from, from Deepwater Horizon. Uh, you know, the purpose of this report is to compare and contrast the two organizing federal authorities for oil spill response. The national response framework is ultimately the overarching guidance that we have for emergency management and response in this, in this country. That's that bottom up, all, you know, all incidents start and then locally framework that talks about how it starts local, you add in county, and then you layer on county, state, and federal assets as they are needed, and only when they're needed, right? You don't just send everything, right? So I already remember from uh, Hurricane Katrina way back when, you know, the governor or the mayor of New Orleans. You know, said, so we need help. And I said, what do you need? He said, send everything. Well, that's, that's, that sounds good, but it's useless, right? You, you, know, you need to have a system to identify what is actually um, needed and necessary. So there's that, that's the national response framework, which guides everything. And then the national contingency plan governs oil spill response. And so there was this recognition back for deep water um, that one is bottom up, like I described, and the other one is a, is a fed down response. And that's not a bad thing. I'm, I'm not maligning federal state partners. I'm going to be a fed in two weeks, right? So. Um, <laughs> Um, but it, it is different, and it, it, is, it is fundamentally different, and we need to align and fill some of those gaps. And it says, to make recommendations to clarify roles, reduce redundancy, align the processes, and recommend changes to provide for the most effective and efficient response. And so that really you know, mirrors a lot of what we had. It also says the National Contingency Plan, which is the oil spill plan, should be updated to create a larger and clearer role for state and local officials in the oil spill response. Also said state and local officials should receive mandatory training on the National Contingency Plan in relation to oil spill response. So when our oil spill happened, we hadn't done either of those things well, right? The, the state and the feds had not done a good job of, of ensuring that local expertise was, was planned for and incorporated in the response. And on the local level, we hadn't done what we should, which was to make sure that our necessary local stakeholders received training on our oil spill contingency plan, which directly feeds into the national contingency plan, right? There's plenty of, plenty of fault to go around. Um, but it's pre-identified. This is just an illustration of that process I told you about, basically the traditional disaster declaration process, right? Where boom happens, we're gonna say, you start at boom, and there's a left of boom and right of boom. boom. Right of boom is everything <laughs> that happens after boom, right? Um, but uh, sometimes you do get things left of boom. So when there's a hurricane, um, you know, you see it coming, they can't pre-deploy federal resources out of there. But traditionally, most, most disaster or disasters are no-notice events. Everything's right of boom. But local res responders come, respond, um, elected to point officials activate their local emergency operations center. If necessary, they request state mutual aid, mutual aid and state assistance. 
So sometimes we go to the state, we'll go to Sacramento and request assistance. Within the fire and uh, law enforcement world, they don't have to wait and go through all those. There are mutual aid systems already in effect. So like when, when the police incident occurs, you don't have time to draft up a legal document and send it to Sacramento. There are automatic alarms that trigger um, regional responses from police and fire folks. So that's covered under there. Uh, when it goes up and it keeps getting bigger, then the governor will activate the state EOC, they'll assess damage, uh, request mutual aid from other parts uh, of the state. Uh, and then um, what happens is if the state declares and requests a declaration, the state will evaluate and if the state agrees, then they will request, they'll declare and they'll request a presidential declaration. And they send it to the FEMA region, which is, in, we're part of region nine, that's where I'm gonna be working up in Oakland. And then they do uh, an assessment and they'll either agree with it or not. And if they do, then they send it to FEMA headquarters because of the FEMA administrator and FEMA administrator reviews, reviews it. And if they agree, then they send it to the president to be signed. And um, you know, the FEMA administrator will never send a declaration request to the president to sign if, if it's not going to get signed. You don't put the president in a position to, to say no to that. They just, by that point, it's going to happen, right? And so that's the traditional disaster response. And that's completely different than what happens in an oil spill response, right? Which is where feds and, and state go immediately. And in most places, there's not a mechanism or a framework to then to go back down and, and pull in and incorporate your locals. And that's everything from local expertise and knowledge and resources, but also then, um, you know, coordinating effectively with your local elected officials and your local citizens and communicating with them. So that's, that's the gap we've got to solve. And that's what we're working on. Um, so this is from our oil spill. You can find this online if you Google it. It's, it's on the county's websites. It's the Santa Barbara County After Action Report for the Refugio oil spill. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot in there that's relevant, but, um, you know, we talked about some of the commonalities between there was the Costco Bassan spill up in San Francisco. Uh, so Costco Bassan, um, I, I don't I can't remember how many counties that impacted, but here's what I can tell you. They did not have an agreement. Um, San Francisco city and county of San Francisco did not have an agreement in place and uh, they could not get a foot in the door of the incident command post. They had great difficulty. There was a lot of uh, angst and teeth gnashing and they were not happy about it. And so since then, San Francisco is what they've done is a different tact. They've gone and they are now part of the federal plan. It's called the area contingency plan. So we're part of the LA Long Beach area contingency plan. Um, they have their own up there for the, uh, for the Bay Area and they're part of that. Now the difference is, so they are included now. That's good, that's a good thing, right? Um, the difference is, is that um, that plan calls for one representative to represent local interest. And up in the Bay Area, if you have a big spill, you could have 10 counties impacted, right? And so, um, I mean, we know what would happen here. If there were a big spill here in Southern California that affected everything between LA and Santa Barbara, LA is the 800 pound gorilla, right? I say that, I used to work for the, uh, for the state of Chicago. I know that the, the 800 pound gorilla gets in the door and LA would, would, would get that, right? And so we need to fight for, or make sure we represent Santa Barbara County's interest. And so we, that's why we have that MOU. So that's the difference that San Francisco now does have a role up in the Bay Area, but it's more limited. They get to have a local government on scene coordinator. And if there's a spill here, it doesn't matter. They can have as many other locals as they want, but they've got to include Santa Barbara County. So that's why we like that. Um, Good news though is oh, well, so, some different some commonalities. Information sharing, establishing a unified message, managing volunteers, we did a lousy job of that, incorporating local stakeholders and increasing support to local stakeholders as it applies to scientific and environmental issues are common findings and recommendations. Um, good news, is, as of January 2016, the EPA, who maintains the National Contingency Plan, had a proposed rule change in the Federal Register to align the National Contingency Plan with the National Response Framework and National Incident Management System. So, we're in agreement. We all recognize the broad things that need to be done. However, the devil's, the devil's going to be in the details, right? And so that's what we're working on now um, to try and make that happen. So um, same deal in ours. This was um, from our oil spill response. We identified synergy with state and federal after action reports. And it's, you know, it's an engagement of local government and NGO partners. It's clarifying the roles and responsibilities of the local on team coordinator. Um, we're, we, we're not well practiced or trained to um, uh, have our folks fulfill that role of the local on scene coordinator. State and federal partners were not well practiced and well trained to incorporate and <coughs> partnered and practiced and working with the local on scene coordinator. We all need to do a better job of that. Uh, enhancing public engagement, including the use of volunteers, and improvement in operations of the Joint Information Center, going back to um, that issue. One of the problems was that when we created a Refugio, Refugio response website, that it was the oil company that. Uh, that, I mean, just because they wanted to do things quickly, they went ahead and set it up and bought and paid for that. But the downside of that was it was great. We had a website up right away. 
Um, the downside was that that was then viewed as, oh, well, that's the oil company's propaganda website. And very understandably so, right? And so we, one of the things we've talked about is, you know what, that's one of those areas that government needs to maintain and hold that. Um, there may be nothing untowards whatsoever, but that needs to be a government-owned website that manages that. And just to give, you know, transparency and, and uh, validity to the, to the information stored there within. Um, so what, what else are we doing? All right, so I mentioned earlier that we did not do a good job on the local end. I mean, and, and we can talk about, we can point fingers, uh, you know, and, and identify fault everywhere, but certainly the local end, one of the things we hadn't done was to train our local stakeholders. So that means our local emergency management, fire, um, law enforcement personnel, it also means the jurisdictional personnel, it means everybody. So one of the things we did was we recently held about six weeks ago an oil spill workshop in Santa Barbara County, right? So we brought in um, all the locals, but we also brought in the NGOs. So we had everybody from the Environmental Defense Center to uh, the uh, channel keeper there, and we had state federal partners. I'm very happy and very proud to say that we have a great spirit of, of commitment and cooperation with our state and federal partners. Um, you know, there's, um, there were some headaches during the response um, because we all just wanted to get things done. Um, but we've definitely, all, we were definitely all on the same page of identifying all the things that we want to do together. So we have a great partnership with the Coast Guard and with um, State Department of Fish and Wildlife in Oxford. Been incredibly supportive and this is a process we're working through with them. So this is part of that partnership was um, this is primarily a state-led workshop to provide input on what the, the, the state's plans are, with, what the plans for oil spill response are within the state of California, because they vary a little bit. Um, so it's also what we're doing is part of what's called the Area Committee, um, which is led by the Coast Guard and uh, the state. Um, we've identified uh, commonalities between um, our, all three of our after-action reports. So there's some excerpts here from our respective after-action reports. And we set up four different areas, four different working groups to work together to try and close the gaps on those. Because you know, it's great that we've identified and we're on the same page now, but now we need to do something about it, right? So um, whether it's information management um, or whether it's operational needs or command and control issues, we've identified different working groups who needs to be involved with those and then what deliverables we can take away to then all of us update our respective plans. So state, federal, and local plans can all then be updated and changed accordingly. We definitely need to update our local plan. There's a fourth working group that is devoted to um, technology so as part of the response and that's one thing that's one area where the Coast Guard said we need to keep that government only to focus on what because it's going to be government sponsored technologies they're using the other three um, working groups are open to the public we genu genuinely want the input of the public which is why we very much wanted the EDC and channel keeper and other NGOs to be part of, and, and reps and the local elected officials to be part of it it does us no good I mean I can go and, and, and sit in an office and write a plan and update a plan, and it may be the world's best plan, but if I haven't effectively socialized that and trained local stakeholders in it, it's meaningless, right? And so um, those other three working groups are, are open to any of our uh, affiliated groups and partners. We want that to be as broad as possible. So um, this is uh, just the cover of our oil spill contingency plan. You can find that on our website as well. If you just Google it, it'll pop up. Um, and it needs to be updated. And it's supposed to be updated every three years. We started to update it within three years, didn't finish it, oil spill happened. and. So it's, we're in the process of doing that now, but we want to work through these working groups to do that. And our goal is that within six months that we'll all be in a position to have our planes updated within that six month period. So um, that's that's what I have. I'm happy to hang out as long as you like to have questions. Though. Great. Let's first thank you, Bob. That was great. <laughs> questions? I have a question. So you're talking about managing local volunteers. You know, everybody mm -hmm. wanted to volunteer, but it wasn't exactly safe if they didn't have training. Is there going to be, or is there, like some sort of training course? Like I can go get CPR certified or first aid certified. Like, is there like a little class workshop that people can take and target maybe like people that live along the coast or mm -hmm. college campuses along the coast and give it and just have it, and then in case something happens. That's a, a great question. So um, that, that uh, Haswhopper, the full Haswhopper course, um, we've talked about trying to provide funding to provide that training. But the problem is then you also have to do uh, update it annually, right? And so there's a real commitment, yeah. both financial and time and otherwise, to do that. So that's something we're exploring, but we're trying to figure out where do we get the most bang for our buck. We don't want to waste taxpayer dollars just by providing training that, that will be used by people who then don't maintain it or go away, right? So there's that. During the response, we got a one-time waiver to do an abbreviated HAZWOPER training. So we worked with the state and they got, they said it's a one-time waiver and that's it. So we did a, 
a short version. So we, we brought people in for one day, an eight hour training, gave them this abbreviated HASWAPER training. So then we did put them out there. We did put volunteers out there to clean in, in some of the beach areas. The blunt truth is we didn't put them into the heaviest hit areas because there were still safety concerns. Um, there's something called the Disaster Service Worker Program under the state. So we had people then sworn in as disaster service workers. Um, so they'd at least be covered by workman's comp if they got hurt while doing it. And that's a real concern about the getting hurt part. Number one, there is the oil ingestion issue. Uh, some people are more susceptible to the others and, than others and do develop real ailments from in, in just inhaling it and being near it or certainly touching it. Um, there was also, out on a lot of those beaches, there was what we referred to as carnivorous cobble, right? So this, this, <laughs> these beaches weren't just sand beaches. Most places they were heavy cobble out there, right? And so um, it was really treacherous to walk on it. So the most common injury we had during our response was twisted ankles. So you know, we brought in 1,300 laborers to go out there and clean. Um, and so, uh, but that was the most common injury was, it was a twisted ankle and especially coming up and down the cliff sites and getting in there to work in areas. There were a lot of pocket beaches. Um, so we were beholden to the tide schedule and daylight um, to, in order to get in there. So a lot of beach areas where we might only have uh, you know one or two hours a day, and in some instances, no hours of the day where we could get crews in to clean in those pocket beaches, and that was one of the challenges. I mean, on day one, the oil company said, hey, not a problem. We'll come in and we will sandblast every inch. Of we'll cart all that cobble away and bring you fresh new cobble. We'll bring it in from somewhere else, and um, that's unacceptable, right? Because that's not the native cobble to that area. So one of the people we were partnering with and making sure we're included were the local Chumash uh, uh, tribe. This is sacred to them. You can't just cart, you know, cart away their cobble and then bring in cobble from Texas or somewhere and jump it off there and say that you've repaired it. I mean, that was an option. That would have been easier than paying 1,300 workers out there for months to do that every day to just haul away the, the, the beach that was covered in oil. Or they said, you know, sand, the cliff faces that had oil on them, said, you know, we can come in and sandblast it, but then you have all the, because which is what they've done in previous oil spill responses going back to Exxon Valdez and, one of the areas, but then you find that you're doing more damage than, than, than help, right? And so that's the ultimate guidance with those SCAT teams is you don't want to do, you don't want to make things worse, right? And so if you go in and you sandblast or you scrape everything off the rock, what other organisms are you killing on, on those, those cliff faces in order to do that? And so there's a whole different set of training to identify and to come up with the appropriate um, techniques to use depending on each, and in each little segment we had a different um, plan to clean within that segment based off of everything from the uh, biological uh, or um, uh, geological uh, 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 issues within that site, but also um, safety too, right? So one of the, I mean, there were all these all these goofy headaches that we dealt with that I'm sure the general public didn't know about, didn't know about. and one of them was um, uh, we had a lot of oil up the wash up on the shore next to cliff faces out and near the state parks out there. And um, we, you know, one of, as part of that ICS system, we always have a safety officer and a system of safety officers. So every crew had a safety officer with an, you know, with an air horn so that there were any, any unsafe conditions, they could halt work and make sure that everybody got home safely, right? Um, one of the problems is um, we had uh, a geologist that was part of the, you know, was part of the safety officer team out there. And they said, well, you can't, those, those cliff faces are unstable. You can't have people out there working. And so we had people out there with hard hats and said, no, you can't have them with, you can't have anybody within 25 feet of those cliff faces cleaning. And we said, well, that's just ridiculous. That's 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 unacceptable. I mean, how are we going to sit there and tell the general public, you know, every other day of the year, your toddler can come out here and play in these cliff faces. It's sick parts, right? Uh, but we can't have these big burly uh, workers and hard hats out there to clean it. But that was the type of issue we dealt with. So we got a different geologist to come out. And, <laughs> and he said 50 feet. So all of a sudden, we're like, listen, we can't, we can't have people within 50 feet of the rock faces that are cleaning. We're only clean within 50 feet of the shoreline. And so... Um, those are the types of things we had to overcome. So there were a lot of different methods that we used to overcome that. One of them was um, dry ice blasting on the initial cliff face, right? So dry, dry ice blasting basically froze, uh, froze the oil so it could be chipped off or would fall away and then could just be scooped up and, and carted away, which is a much cleaner approach than sandblasting, which they used before, where you're, and you're not doing the damage that you would. And number two, you have all that, that runoff from sandblasting, which is then you know, pollutant and is making things worse. Um, we, and then we did, uh, we brought in overhead scaffolding and set it up so that there would be protection for the workers along the, the cliff face to work on it. Um, but, you know, th those, are, those are the reasons why it took, you know, many, many months to really clean it up all out there. And if you go out there today, you'll still find a, a lot of um, uh, rocks and, and cliff faces out there where all, not, all, not all of the oil is gone. But we got it down to what we can do. What, what the scientists came up with were acceptable standards that weren't doing more harm than good. So when they got it down to certain below a certain percentage level of oil coverage on rocks, and that was deemed to be safe and acceptable. But in order to make that, um, to, in order to give validity to that and to make it transparent, that's where we really needed to include the local expertise, right? I mean, let's face it. If some contractor from Alaska or from Texas comes in and says, "No, we that's clean enough, and it's that's what it ought to be." Nobody's going to take their word for it, and you have to have local expertise. So whether it's our planning and development or public health 
our environmental health folks or the, um, the NGOs to go out there that are accompanying with them and observing it and taking part in those conversations. There's just not going to be the goodwill there otherwise. And so that's, that's something we adjusted and did on the fly and we'll be in a better position to do in the future. God forbid it, if another spill happens, but. Were there any dispersants used on the surface though? No, absolutely not. And that was clear from day one. I mean, they had to use them in other spills. I mean, it was clear that, um, number one, um, it just wasn't going to be effective in, in this type of spill. And number two, that was very clear. That was one thing there was agreement on immediately from day one with the Coast Guard and the state was there will be no use of dispersants in the area. Um, that's an issue, though, that like it, it was the first or the second press conference where that question came up. It might have been the second or even third. And, um, and, and it came up in a number of, it kept coming up the press conferences. And I remember there's one press conference in particular where um, the person that was answering that question just didn't answer it well. And they said something to the effect of, um, what did they say? They, they gave her a very nebulous answer of, uh, like, no, the use of dispersants is, is, you know, has not been considered. That wasn't it. But whatever it was, it didn't, it didn't unequivocally say, no, we're not using it. It just gave the, the nebulous answer, kind of the, you know, um, uh, discouraged or something. Yeah, it said something like, well, it's been, you know, it's been evaluated and, and found to not be blah, 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 blah. But it just come out and say, no, it, it, absolutely positively not. There have been no dispersants used and we will not use any and use plain language. And they gave kind of a, an equivocal answer that didn't do us any favors, you know. So, so, so do you guys have, have you guys thought about that exact issue, which is uh, environmental communication firms on contingency plan that would just come in and be a bit more, uh, practiced at responding to those types of questions? Yeah, so canned messaging is part of it. So we have canned messaging for other types of threats, right? So when it comes to Zika virus or Ebola or in influenza, whatever it is, there's canned messaging that all public health departments and emergency management agencies maintain and just pull out and plug in the specifics and then give somebody their talking points, right? Um, but part of the problem, too, is that um, there was a lot of good information that was given out at press conferences, but um, the media wants to cover the juicy and salacious parts, right? So, I mean, I spoke at some press conferences. I never made, I was never shown on TV, which I'm happy about, all right? Like, <laughs> nobody wants to hear what the guy in emergency management says, right? But the oil company and the Coast Guard, those are the two people they wanted to hear about, and that's where all the questions went. And um, so even though the public health director may have made statements that were useful, if it they're only going to run the 30 seconds or the 60 seconds or whatever it is that, that you think the public wants to see. So that's part of our challenges with public information is um, forcing out information or making it accessible, even if it's not the information that's pushed out by the media. Cool. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, what it was like when there were issues like, for example, the, the geol one geologist says you can't do this and you know, one, one part of the incident uh, command says X and the other says Y. How do you, how's that managed? Or how do you? Well, like I said, ultimately the Coast Guard has 51%, but I can genuinely say um, that there was never any point where um, the Coast Guard had to play, you know, the trump card. We um, had lots of lots of extended long conversation, right? So, um, and we always got to a point where we, we had agreement within, within the UC. And I'd say, I mean, the spirit of cooperation w was great. Um, I, I have no problem with saying that the UC it was laser focused on response and considered a lot of the other issues such as press conferences as kind of a headache. I mean, so the example would be, the UC was in there making decisions on controlling the operational response to, to, to the oil and trying to figure out things. Hey, well, gee, how do we get a, around these safety issues? And how do we bring in these other alternative techniques for cleaning? Uh, but then every press release um, that went out had to be signed by every member of the Unified Command. And so we'd have this inbox where these press releases would get dropped off in there. And I can tell you, just naturally, um, they would be kind of the lower priority. And people would really be seizing and working on the real operational issues. And that press, that draft press release would linger for hours. And in one instance, I think, more like a day or two, right? And so, because everybody would have to read it and perhaps go back to their home agency and have their, their lawyers or, or subject matter experts look at it, depending on, the, on what type of press release it was or what plan it was or a lot of sub plans. And, um, uh, you know, there were times when, so for example, early on, the County Department of Public Health wanted to put out some general information about um, air quality issues, right? Working with their pollution control, control district, what was safe, what types of symptoms you might, you know, feel and when to go to a doctor, that kind of thing. And it, it took like two days to get that press release approved and signed out. And that should never, ever happen again. And part of just having clear ground rules at the beginning of saying um, what type of information needs to be blessed and signed and approved by all the members of the Unified Command and what if, it's, if you're just talking about issues that are really germane to just your agency or your level of government, that you just send it out, you know, and, and you don't have to wait and go through that process. And so that's the type of area where we kind of 
bang ourselves out. Um, you know, we had, uh, I mean, we wanted to make sure that we um, incorporated uh, local knowledge that included all the, the true mash. And so we uh, um, had, for every 25 workers out on the beach, we had a, a tribal representative out there so that if they uncovered any artifacts that they could, you know, halt playing and take a look and identify what the artifact was and what it meant and whether they should should just, um, stop or what, what, what they would need to do before they could continue um, cleaning mm -hmm. operations and, mm -hmm. and how to safely deal with that or, and respectfully deal with it. So I mean, those are I think those are you know, some of the other examples of, of issues that we spend a lot of time dealing with that people probably don't realize. But as far as coming back to that decision point, it was really through conversation. And most of them were really quick. I mean, most of them, there was little little if any disagreement on. Probably the ones that were most, we had to have the most discussion were related to the, the public information issues, when to have a press conference, when to stop having press conferences, when to have those town hall meetings, when not to. Um, and then there was something that we called uh, the phase three plan, which was ongoing monitoring and maintenance of the beach. And that's probably the single biggest area where it, that took us weeks before we could all agree on it. And uh, that's probably the one area where the most political um, involvement was. And so basically it was, um, Phase, the phase one was initial response and those plans that was quickly identified because it's all in conjunction with currently existing plans. Phase two was the testing and how clean is clean. Um, there's a little bit of angst over that, but that was signed and agreed upon pretty quickly because those are scientific standards. It may take some time to socialize and educate people on them, but they were pretty quickly agreed upon. But phase three was how long was the unified command gonna have people going out along the beaches and testing those tar balls, and then what we were going to do if you found a positive tar ball that was linked to 901, and how long that was going to go on for. And that's where we did have differences of opinion, where, of course, a lot of these people just wanted to go home at a certain point, right? Whether it was the oil company, whether it's the Coast Guard, whoever it is. And um, we, that's, we really had to have a long discussion about saying, no, we want, you know, we want monitoring to go on through the end of this year, which is why through the end of December, we're going to have, you know, people out there testing. And we have, we had one, throughout the whole follow-up testing period, I think we had one, um, possibly positive uh, tar ball that, that was found, but it's been it's been um, pretty clean, yeah. so to speak. So um, uh, that that was where we spent weeks, and that's where um, elected officials on the local and the state level did get involved, and um, ultimately. Um, so I mean, I, we did not have as the locals the 51 percent. We were you know less than the 49 technically, uh, but that's one area where we did have to get some political assistance and. Uh, Ultimately, a decision was made. No, you know, um, you will uh, work well with the locals, and if that's what the locals want, that's what's going to happen. And so, uh, that did work out well ultimately. But it took us weeks to get there, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of a lot of gray hairs. <laughs> cool. Other questions? Uh, what steps did you take to kind of influence you successfully achieving a career like this with a background in English? Wow, wow, that's that's a whole different story. <laughs> Career uh, question. Yeah, um, no, that, that was a good question because emergency management. Uh, there are when I got in emergency management, you came into it by some other public safety discipline, generally speaking, right? But now there are emergency management educational programs. You can start it off with some master's programs and a couple PhD programs and other undergrad degrees as well. And so a lot of people do study it now. And pros and cons of studying emergency management versus coming at it from another background, and that other background can be. Uh, could be law enforcement, but could also be, you know, coming in with a, with a scientific background is also helpful as well, right? And so um, there, it's a jack of all trades profession, right? I myself fell into it. I mean, I was like you know, back in that path of do I go to grad school? Do I, you know, gee, am I going to be an English professor someday? And um, figuring out there was no money in that. <laughs> no, it, um, anyway, there, I, I would never get tenure. Um, so um, I wanted to get editing experience. I thought, well, I'll go into publishing or editing. And I, this is in Chicago, and I volunteered for the local homeless newspaper called Streetwise that homeless people saw. They need lots of volunteer assistance uh, um, editing and then writing uh, stories sometimes. And so I would write stories for them. And at one point they said, I write a story on the history of police brutality in Chicago. So I spent six weeks doing that and interviewing people, and I interviewed the person that was the head of that unit of the police department at the time. And at the end, um, they said, well, you know, I've been hiring investigators in a few months. You ought to apply. And so I did. And I didn't write a very flattering article, and they still hired me. So <laughs> for, that was good. And I did that for seven years, and that was a great job. Um, uh, investigating officer-involved shooting incidents in police, uh, de or deaths in police custody. Uh, fascinating job. Uh, and, uh, but ultimately, I kind of figured after seven years of that, I was like, it's a very narrow career field, uh, internal administrative investigations. And uh, um, my boss at the time went over to become the chief of staff. In Chicago, the Office of Emergency Management and Communications is a huge organization because it's not just emergency management. There are only like 15 or 20 of us in there. But um, it's also the 911 Center for Police, Fire, and EMS 
um, resources in the city of Chicago. It's traffic management. It's public. Uh, it's, it's public event permitting. It's, I mean, it's like it, all told, it's like 1,400 employees. It's a massive organization. But my boss went over to be the chief, uh, chief of staff there and said, hey, you want to go? What do you think about emergency management? And I didn't know much about it, but I thought, well, long term, uh, there's probably a lot more variety and in, in, uh, opportunities, a wider variety of opportunities in emergency management. So I made the switch to that in 2005. And, yeah, and then some, uh, after I worked there from 2005 until about two years ago, and then uh, um, somebody offered me a job out here, and then uh, it's been great in Santa Barbara, um, but the FEMA opportunity uh, will be a whole, it's, it's recovery, so it's not response, it's recovery, long-term recovery from disasters, so I've got a lot to learn about that, but um, so I'm going to be overwhelmed for the next 18 months, I'm sure, just trying to, to learn it, and if you see me 18 months from now, I'll be 100% <laughs> great, I'm sure, so. Cool. Other questions? I have, I have one. I have one last one that, that is, and, and maybe this is a bit unfair to ask of you, but but um, and one of these things that is, you know, kind of we see all the time, having worked many oil spills. <clears throat> one of the things is uh, getting in to get time critical data, and uh, you know, a lot of times we have unique skill sets or mm -hmm. unique uh, whatever, and um, and we would like to sample so that we can understand either either how the oil spill say would evolve or oftentimes what the impact on the resources. And mm -hmm. a lot of times that stuff, if you don't get it right then, you're never gonna get it. And then mm -hmm. people argue for years in court about X or Y. And, and invariably it's those requests, you know, we fill out the form, fill out the request form, permission form, and, and it goes into a black box. And of yep. course there's the safety issue with, you know, hey, we gotta keep the vessels off the water or this, that, and, and we get that. But there seems to be another level of why does this stuff just disappear? Mm -hmm. why, do, why are we filling out 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 requests yep. that nobody seems to know about? Um, so, yeah, ab absolutely. And so one of the issues that we're working on with the working groups is pre-identification and, and pre maybe pre-existing contracts uh, or agreements with um, a uh, academia to um, come in and offer assistance and feedback and also just transparency and, and, um, and access, right? Because that's part of, of success going forward and we recognize that. So what we, yeah, this was done just in time where um, UC would approve requests for scientific access and to come in and sample and survey. And it's, that's a less than, than perfect process, right? And so we also recognize that we blew some good, some really good expertise, right? We need to have local expertise, right? So, uh, you know, we're especially looking at some of the UC SB um, partners there. Um, and so some of them um, we were, you know, when it came to examination of fingerprints or feedback, where well, we need that expertise and we want to have that in our, in our back pocket. Um, and so frankly, some people came in and con then also came in as contractors and were contracted for expedience sake um, with the oil company. And then we're, frankly, we're kind of tainted by that. So then afterwards, um, then we would talk about, you know, getting information or whatever from some, from, from some of those partners. And we heard some pushback from our local elected and some other leadership saying, well, wait a second, they work for the oil company. They're not, they're not you know, unbiased, which I, I did not believe to be the case whatsoever, but the perception's there, right? And perception matters, right? So we need to earn that in advance. I can't remember which of those four working groups is dealing with that. Um, those working groups just started up recently as I knew that I was taking an exit for the door, so I have not been as involved sure. with, we have our staff involved with those sure. and other county partners. Um, but I can find out for you which of those working groups is working with that and figure out how you guys can get plugged in because it's a great point. That's um, we, we want to figure that out before boom happens, not not after boom happens. And then one last one just to give us an update. So where are we? So the lines have not been reactivated. Where are we in terms of having oil flow again in 901 and 9? Boy, that's uh, that's that's definitely a question that goes beyond emergency management. There are a lot of issues there. It's not just the pipeline issues, although those are very real. And that part, I mean, so there's also this whole um, there's the whole long term. We're, we're not done with the response by by any stretch, right? There there are groups that can be examining the long term impacts of this oil spill on the area for years to come, and then also um, loving um, the you know loving fines and getting assistance from the oil company to continue to pay for that for years to come that's that's going to continue to happen and as far as the pipeline so we don't have um those are going to be there's lo there are local planning and development permit uh, authorities but then there are also the state and federal ones as well and those are going to be their decisions um frankly the, the price of oil factors that into that as well my guess is that um just me talking is that the oil company is not particularly bothered about getting it started right now because oil is cheap and getting cheaper right and so that matters too if, if oil were you know, a hundred hundred dollars a barrel, one hundred and twenty-five a barrel, or whatever. Um, there might be more pressure to get those back up and on. And then there are the impacts that those have on the local economy as well, right? I mean, all of these things are intertwined. Um, it's it, you know, 
which is why you need to have you know more integrated uh, involvement and response. You know, uh, you know, you can have the Coast Guard and emergency management and, and fish and wildlife manager response, but it's not going to begin to deal with all those issues and interests yeah. and concerns, and, and you can't separate them. Yeah. Cool. All right. If there's no questions, let's, let's thank Bob one more time. That was great.